Hey, here's something to think about. Every record you own and every song that you've ever played or loved or downloaded or shared with people has got a story behind it. Even the stuff that you may not know from artists that you may or may not be all that familiar with have got something to tell. And it's my job to help sift through every single one of those stories. Welcome to Baxi's Musical Podcast. If you like what you hear today, share it, rate it, review it, pass it around to all your friends, and be sure to follow the show on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook for regular updates on upcoming episodes. Today, we're brought to you by Metro Chrysler Dodge Jeep and Ram of Chicopee. Visit Metro's state-of-the-art dealership right next to BJ's and Big Y on Memorial Drive, or visit MetroJeep.com and drive home in your new Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram today. And now, here's today's interview with Mark Burgess from The Chameleons on Baxi's Musical Podcast. What is it? What is it? It's Baxi's Musical Podcast. Resistance is useless. One of the great things about doing this podcast is getting the chance to introduce people to music that they might not already know. I'm not necessarily talking about the up-and-coming artists who are just starting out, although I like talking to them too. I'm talking about those who have been neglected and overlooked over the course of many years. I'm talking about the people whose music is so profoundly rich and beautiful that it defies logic and rational thought as to why they have remained hidden and undiscovered for so long. In today's episode, I'm going to try to accomplish one of two things. I'm either going to expose you to one of the greatest bands you've never heard, or I'm going to validate things that you already know because somebody already beat me to it. The band I'm talking about is the Chameleons. And while there's a very good chance that the Chameleons may have slipped under your radar since they released their first album, Script of the Bridge, 41 years ago, there's an even better chance that you'll be thanking me later when you finally get the chance to hear what I'm talking about. Because there is no middle ground when it comes to the chameleons. The chameleons are either going to be unfamiliar to you or they are going to completely obliterate your perception of who was arguably one of the greatest bands of the 1980s. Don't believe me? Why don't you stop what you're doing, fire up YouTube, and listen to their song Swamp Thing from their astonishing 1986 album Strange Times. Then listen to the rest of it. Then, listen to their first two albums, like 1983's debut, Script of the Bridge, which I've already mentioned, or their 1985 follow-up, What Does Anything Mean, Basically. Then, try to listen to their 2001 comeback album, Why Call It Anything, and then tell me I'm full of crap. The Chameleons were a band out of Manchester, England, the city that brought you the Smiths, the Buzzcocks, Joy Division, the New Order, the Fall, Oasis, the Sound, and the Stone Roses, all great bands, but as I'm sitting here today, I cannot tell you why that the Chameleons haven't been in that same conversation with the rest of them as equals, at the very least, other than to say this was the career that the Chameleons were hoping for, to be independent, to be in control of the integrity of their own music and their own destiny, even at the expense of greater recognition. But it should be important to note that the Chameleon's legacy shouldn't just be about what they failed to do or that they didn't get their due. The real story should be about a band that refused to compromise as they made some of the greatest albums in post-punk history. That's a damn strong statement. But if you know, you know. The Chameleons are about to release their first set of new music in 23 years. And having heard it, I can tell you firsthand, it is amazing. Just like everything else that they have ever done. The Chameleons will also be in tour throughout the summer, a tour which includes stops at the Space Ballroom in Hamden, Connecticut on August 9th and at the Sinclair Theater in Cambridge, Massachusetts on August 10th, where they'll be performing Strange Times in its entirety, and it will be freaking fantastic. And so it was a real, true pleasure to speak to singer, songwriter, bass player Mark Burgess from The Chameleons on Baxi's Musical Podcast. Great to see you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, uh, I I appreciate you doing this. This is a this is one of those interviews I have wanted to do for the last four years. So to get you is is a, is a really exciting for me. So thank you so much for taking the time. You're welcome. So as I was given the advanced preview of the uh, the new EP. Where are you? And as someone who's been a fan of the Chameleons for the last forty some odd years, I just 
I just love it. I mean, this is, you know, it's the first set of real new music in, in 20 years. And uh, I'm sure people have been hounding you forever about this, but I got to ask the question, what the hell is taking you so long? Oh, that's a good question. Um, this is the first time really, I think, I've had with the, I felt all the components are actually there. Um, because, we were, you know, Chameleons was never a band where you had like, you know, like my mate's band, The Wedding Present, he's the songwriter. He provides all the song. He writes all the songs, and he brings the band in. We've never been that way, you know. We've always been like, you know, we've. It's always been a communal effort. Everyone's been always had an input, and it's the first time really that all those components have kind of been there. I mean, obviously, Reg coming back in was a huge factor. Uh, Reg coming back to the band because he, you know, he and I wrote a lot of those songs together. Initially, at least got them started. Um, you know, got the got the ball rolling on them. And um, so having Reg back was obviously a major factor. Um, we were, it would have happened sooner had we not had the the um, corona, uh, the COVID pandemic. That really put a block on things because we were ready to start. Um, but even that was kind of fortuitous in a way because I think when we're in a much better place now than we were then to to really create something that we're this excited about. So, I mean, with, with Stephen coming on to guitar, um, Danny coming in full time um, on on our, on keyboards and piano and stuff, um, and then Todd in the drum stool. It's the first time since the original the you know Comedians Prime broke up that I felt I, that I'm in a band properly, fully, yeah. that I'm with people that I can actually write with, and everybody has been bringing their air game to what we're doing. So it it's really just been um, the the short answer, I suppose, is the planets aligned, you know. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it, it definitely shows that something is uh, is connecting again. I mean, the three songs, you know, Where Are You, the first single, Endlessly Falling, and Forever, and and there's a full album coming out later in the year, Arctic Moon, and I'm already hearing things in advance that say it's really, really good, and I'm not surprised that the first three songs, if they're indicative of what's to come, it's going to be a monster. Well, only the A side is actually from the album because we didn't want to pull anything else off it. I mean, we've got a few that are, are closely to finished. Um, we've got to finish the album in July. We're on about halfway through it, I think. And we're actually writing more material than we need to want to keep our options open uh, on that score. But we actually test drove another of the big songs from the album <laughs> recently. We did a, we did a, a, I say a, a semi, oh, let's call it a semi-acoustic set, um, a couple of nights at a, at a place just around the corner from where the studio is. And um, we decided to preview one of the big songs from the album that night as well, although Todd couldn't be with us because Todd had already returned to the United States. So we, we actually had Todd playing drums on a on the computer. And he's playing it, but it's we it's pre, you know, it's obviously from the actual album take. And then we all played to that. And then we had him up on a on a, at the end, we put him on a video <laughs> screen so he could say hello to everybody, and it was a really fun night. But um, we, it, it, it's kind of different again, you know, it, it is very different, um, I think, from what people would normally expect from us. So, um, sorry, my dog's trying to intrude. Um, <laughs> um, it, uh, it's very different from what people would expect for us. So we were kind of nervous about how it would go down. And even though the room was very small, because it was semi-acoustic set two nights, and we played to about, I don't know, maybe I think it was about, 60, 70 people a night or something in this small room. But um, they were hardcore because all these people, you know, like they, 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 they were all like yourself, you know, that go back decades with the band. And the reaction to it was phenomenal, which is all that we hoped. So that gave us a lot of confidence that, you know, because you struggle with that a little bit, you know, you struggle with the legacy element of it because the expectation is obviously high with a lot of the Chameleons fans. And, you know, we didn't we didn't want to. I particularly was uh, very vocal about us not utilizing the guitar sound of somebody that hadn't been in the band for over twenty years. I didn't sure. want to take somebody else's guitar sound. You know, um, even though that guitar sound had become pretty synonymous synonymous with the sound of the band, um, and we were able to get around that. I think you know. Um, so it doesn't actually. You know, you can tell it's the chameleons. It's obviously the chameleons, but. It, it it has a different kind of uh, dynamic about it, and I we all we're all very excited by it. Well, after forty years, I would think there probably would be at least a little bit of an updated sound. That just it's just like the natural progression of things. Well, 
I mean, to be fair, I've been doing Chameleon's Vox, yeah. and that was basically just recreating it. You know, we, we didn't really do anything new with that at all because I didn't think I was, as I've explained, I didn't think I was with the people. I didn't, you know, that that were that I could do that with, you know, that I could you know, do that with. Um, so, I mean, for a long time, you know, and that had been enough, you know, people had just been wanting to come to hear legacy stuff. And, but that was kind of, I was reaching the point where I was thinking, you know, no, I want to do something kind yeah. of new now. I want to break away from this. So when Reg came back, it was perfectly timely. But yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, ordinarily a band should should constantly push be pushing themselves. Yeah. And well, I, I always felt that um, I was a bit of a coward in that in that respect. You know, <laughs> it was Reg. It was Reg who, who, who really cleared it up for me because I was telling him, you know, I was worried before going in. I thought this was going to be a long protracted process because uh, we hadn't written together for such a long time, and, and I hadn't really done anything new for quite a long time. And I, I thought it was going to be a kind of a, of a you know pulling teeth. And, it, and part of that worry was that, like, what I was writing on my own didn't seem to be um, indicative of of a chameleon's vibe. It was, I mean, I couldn't see, I couldn't figure out where this was going <laughs> to fit in. Um, so I was getting very quite anxious about it, and I'm saying, well, you know, and he's going, look, you know, we, you and I, we are the chame we are the chameleons, right? We are chameleons anyway. Um, you know, suddenly we've lost John and Dave's disappeared and you know he's off the radar or whatever we are chameleons so whatever we do is going to be chameleons music and when you when you think about it like that you think fucking hell yeah what am i what am i uh so anxious about you know yeah. and that was the nice thing about now is that i can bring a song that doesn't even look feel like you know i'm, I'm, I'm not sure and they'll all go like i'll listen to it and by the time they've come in on it they've elevated it into something else and it works and so now I feel like I can, I can write songs and bring them to the band and go, well, I've written this song, what do you think? Whereas before, that would never have been um, acceptable yeah. to do that. You know? well, and, and, and obviously, you're not divorcing you know, the, the past either. In fact, uh, you've just released a remastered three-disc edition of Strange Times, including yeah. all the, the, the bonus tracks and colored vinyl. And you know, it's, it's funny, and I don't even know why I, I, this is true. I have two copies of Strange Times. I don't know why I have two. It wasn't enough to buy one. I've got two, and I've also got it on CD too, just in case one of these scratches. And uh, it's. I know just... people. I know people that want the one with the pink border, and people, and they also want the one with the blue border. And you know, I mean, I'm a I'm a vinyl junkie. You yeah. Know, I I you know I even if my uh, turntable is in mothballs, which often it is because I'm moving around so much, I will still prefer to get a vinyl record for the day when I get it out of mothballs. Or whatever. I just, I'm, a, I mean, I just love the whole format. I fell yeah. in love with that format. That format was why I wanted to be in a band. I, I wanted to make records. So, you know, when we discuss these things, these are like if you take the Strange Times package, it was, it was a labor of love for the person that put that together. His name's Chris Connolly. He's been, he's been a Chameleons fan. Uh, I did one of our, one of our very early interviews was for his fanzine. He was mm. like 15 years old when we did that and he's been a fan ever since he's the one who's put that together as somebody who loves the band and loves everything uh, you know loves the ethos that surrounds the chameleons and it's very much a labor of love and I, I my point of view is like that is something you know like i've got a box set of station to station that chris actually brought back for me from japan mm. um uh, from the far east well yeah from japan he brought it back from japan he found it in japan and he went he knows that that's my favorite bowie album and he's like i'm gonna get that and he brought it back for me and it's absolutely amazing in the box it's got um it's got a live performance of station to station in there it's got station to station itself it's got all the fan club pins and left <laughs> postcards and and i'm just like oh this is just so beautiful so i mean you know, that's the sort of thing I, I would like to see from one of my favorite bands. And I think if you're going to pay a lot of money for vinyl now, which you do, you do. I think you feel like you've got something really special and value for money. So, I mean, that we take that kind of very seriously. We're not even doing um, on the new record, you know, on the single rather, we're not even doing CDs on the single. It's going to be straight download with artwork or a vinyl 12 inch. That's all we're doing. Because, I mean, we believe I believe in records, really, you know. Yeah. You know, I, I, and, and, I, and I totally... 
and I'm with you too on that one too. Although I, I do buy a lot of CDs, but you know, like like any collector, you buy a bunch and you they don't even get played. You just you're just happy you have them that they're you know you've completed the you've completed yeah. the catalog. But uh, but that's not the case with the with the, the chameleons. That that these uh, records have gotten a lot of use. I, I remember seeing you guys play live. This goes back. I think like it was uh, 1987 in uh, in Chicago. You played uh, at, the, at the Metro Theater. I think oh, uh, Mighty Lemon much. Drops were with you guys that night, which is another Manchester band that I really, really liked a lot. Yeah. And, and well, I, actually, they're from the, don't, don't let me hear you say that. They're from the Midlands. Uh, well, okay. Well, they're from Wolverhampton. Wolverhampton. My, my mistake. But but nevertheless, I, I remember this so vividly. You guys opened with Swamp Thing. And it was, uh, and I recall that, that feeling, you know, like, and, and Sometimes when you see live music, you may get this moment where you're just thoroughly consumed with this swell of a song. And being in the moment with, you know, seven, eight hundred people or how many people there were that night. And uh, and I think that's what that song was designed to do. But I still find myself getting this incredible adrenaline rush whenever I hear that song. And I'm not even the one playing on it. You must feel the power of that particular song and how it completely ignites a room when it starts. Sure, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's um, it's one of the biggest songs that we do. Um, it's it's strange because when we did it, um, we we'd written I think most of the ideas. Strange times, and we had a meeting with the producer and with Tom Zuta at Geffen, who was overseeing the project at the time, and they were saying, "Yeah, you know, we're still." feel that we need the we need the big song you know we still haven't really got the big song you know like scripts of the bridge had second skin on it and you know um what does anything mean basically you know we have the, whatever i think persian garden i think he said something and we went okay you know we just went okay and like well you know reg had been playing had been uh jamming that intro with uh john but it hadn't really gone anywhere um i had a chorus thing I kind of stuck in my head <laughs> and then I thought, well, there's no reason why they can't go together. And then three days later we had Swamp Thing, you know, we said, well, you know, leave it, leave it with us. And we'll, I mean, it happened really fast. We happened over the course of one rehearsal, you know, I brought that in. I said that that thing that you two have been working on, we'll start with that. And, you know, Dave was on the, Dave was um, going through his Selena where he'd rather play Selena because he had a knack, a nickel allergy. And the strings were causing him to break. His guitar <laughs> strings are causing him to break out in uh, eczema. So he's like, he, he wanted to play on the Selena as much as possible. So he's on that, and we and it, it just came together really, really fast. We just got it, and we looked at each other and went, "Yeah, that's going to work," you know. And when we played it to them, Dave Allen was like, well, "He just didn't expect it, really. He didn't, yeah. he didn't. I could see he didn't expect it." And we got to the studio, and I even quit smoking because I was a sm I'm a smoker. Um, and I, and I, I remember doing um, some early um, takes and like I'm not I'm not happy with the tonality of my voice for this. This needs a little bit of a more mature tonality. And he said, "Well, just stop smoking for a few days." He said, "You don't have to you don't have to quit for good. <laughs> just if you can stay off for three days and do it again, I think that'll help." And it did. You know, it gave it gave my voice a a, a more mature sounding tonality. I mean, it's still I listen to it now and still wish I could redo it, but. Um, <laughs> It, it did it did the job at the time you know and we finished it and it's marked i can remember being with the the lad from depeche mode who died recently um oh andrew yeah I, yeah we were sitting together watching the space shuttle um launch because they used to do them live then um and it exploded right in front of us and we, the, hmm. i ran into the studio and they were doing the the they were stood in a tray of gravel stamping up and down in a tray of gravel for the intro <laughs> and i'm like you know the fucking special just exploded it um that was the first i was one of the first people in in the world to hear walking on sunshine by um katrina and the ways because she was next door and we were working on something <laughs> and she comes rushing out and she goes i was playing pool and she goes can i can i ask you to come and listen to this for a minute and i, I went yeah no problem and what i walked into their control room and they just finished they were walking on sunshine and they played it and we were like what do you think i said it's gonna be fucking huge <laughs> so you've got a fucking hit record oh no thank you all great we're going. that was one of the first people to hear it they just mixed it so i have like all these other little memories around it as well but yeah i mean i knew at the time it was going to be a big song i mean it was like you when we played it it was fucking massive you know when 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 you play that song live 
And he, actually, mm. there's a bunch of songs you could say you know, and probably have the same effect, but in particular, that song. And the fans are reacting to it in such a visceral way, and they do. Yeah. What's in your head when you're, when, you're, when you're playing it and you're seeing the reaction of it? I mean, it's a song uh, that you wrote when you were in your 20s, uh, and here you are about to turn a little bit older, and it still lands on people like a hammer. I mean, it's, it's got to be an amazing up. feeling. My thought is, I hope I don't fuck it up. You know, <laughs> I hope I don't. Um, I hope we play it. I hope I play it right. You know, because like I get so into it sometimes, um, playing bass and stuff. I, let, you know, I just don't. I just don't. I just want it to be as good as we can play it. And I think now that we've got uh, Danny in as well, mm. we can do the Selena's and the guitar. Because I had to play. You know, um, Neil was very good at playing it when we didn't have any keyboards on it and making it work. Um, because of the you know his his command of his craft, but it's nice to have that gu extra guitar on it and the Selena's on it. Now it's more powerful than ever. Uh, we played it. Um, we you know I think we with this current lineup in December when we went to Porto, we did a festival in Porto. That's one of the best versions that we've played up till mm. now. And yeah, man, it took the roof off, and it always you know it always does. I think. Um, it's such a, but you've got to get it absolute tempo's got to be absolutely <laughs> right. You know, that's the other thing as well. You play it too fast or you play it too slow. It kind of like, you don't quite get it. It's got to be, <laughs> the tempo's got to be bang on. But I mean, Todd's really meticulous uh, about that, about his tempos. He works really hard getting everything perfectly right. He's a very uh, ADHD. <laughs> so he's like, yeah, well, which I, is I, great. I yeah. saw a, a performance of it on YouTube from uh, just a few months ago in Montreal, and it it sounded just great to me. I think you tell, I mean, you could tell the crowd really just exploded when you know all of a sudden that that opening riff comes around. He's like, "Holy shit! This is this is gonna be, this is gonna be what I paid for. This is this is exactly why I came to the show." Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was that with the mission. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was it. Was really great. We we had a great time on that tour. We loved it. We 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 really enjoyed it. Um, the only downside for us is that we couldn't bring Danny with us because we couldn't get his work visa sorted out. So we were a man down. Because that's how it feels now. You know, it's like, I mean, Danny was has been working with me on and off for quite a while, but he's never done America with me mm. because we could never get it together. And even in Europe and England, there's a lot of times when he couldn't get there because he had other he had another job to do. Now he's in the band full time. So, um, but that's like that, that really reinforces what I'm saying about how happy I am with every single person and what they're bringing to it and how we feel like a proper band. Cause we were, we were phoning him, <laughs> taking no, diff no, absolutely no, um, notice of the time differences whatsoever. So we were like, he was being woken <laughs> at two in the morning by these crazy nutters in a tour bus, um, all just like phoning him up and saying, God, we fucking miss you, mate. You know, you should, we wish you were here and all that. And he really appreciated that as well. And what he's bringing to it is really great. So this time when we go and do the strange science performances, we'll have Danny with us. And that, and that's great because with Danny with us, it means I have more strings in terms of like where, what songs I can pull. Cause there are some songs that I really don't want to play without him. Yeah. Like tears, for example, mm. I really want him in on that. And, um, yeah, there's a few others, you know, there's a few other things that I really miss his input. So, um, yeah, with the one you saw, I think it's going to be even better now this time because you're going to see the full the full band. You know, I, I know that um, that you there's not an interview that goes by where you don't get asked about the chameleons being overlooked and underappreciated. And, 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 mm -hmm. and every time I've heard you answer those questions, I find myself really respecting the answer. That, it, you know, with you guys, it was never about becoming you know, major rock stars, it was always about the music and even more so about maintaining the integrity of the music. And that may seem like, you know, total BS to somebody, to somebody else, but who doesn't know the band, but it really is how you have viewed your entire career. It's always been about the music. And I, and I just, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Tell me about your desire to keep, you know, all of that managed the way you have. Um, well, it, you, you know, you have to have a certain amount of arrogance, which young, young, a young band, ha you know, it's a necessary thing. You know, it's not a condemnation. I, I, you know, bands, when you're in your early 20s or your mid 20s, you should be arrogant, really. You should think you're the fucking dog's bollocks. You know, you, 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 need, you need that. You need that. Because like, you know, in, in a lot of cases, to get to the point where people are even taking attention, you've had to go through a lot of uh, apathy mm. about what you're doing. And you have to counter that apathy, you know, and every great band has gone through that, 
at one time or another, you know, where they'd regarded as a load of shit, only to turn out to be like one of the best things that ever happened, like the Beatles, for example. So, I mean, you have to have that kind of arrogance and that kind of self-belief. Um, but in our case, it was really very simple because they were, you know, we were getting a lot of interference with how the music should be. And they, if there was one thing that we refused to let anyone mess with was our music because, you know, we'd arrange things, you know. So, I mean, you know, as I say, like Second Skin, for example, is something like seven minute arrangement, right? Right. And we were being told to cut that down to like four minutes. I mean, and if you're, if, you, if you're familiar with our music, you can imagine a four minutes second skin. If you can arrange second skin in four minutes, <laughs> man, I will actually fucking, you know, I'll take you to dinner. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's impossible. And, you know, because that was the way, it was that was the, the thinking of the time was that, you know, your tracks had to be short and concise. And we were writing like these epic tunes like Second Skin and uh, View From A Hill. I remember when they, they were telling us that the ending of View From A Hill was unnecessary. And I'm saying, but it's the end of the album. Yeah, that is the end of the. You know, even at that point, we hadn't even rec we hadn't even got anywhere near to recording scripts of the bridge at that time. And already, I was I heard view from hell. I'm going. That is the closer. That is the end of the of the album. So I mean, you know, and it be and 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 what a good example of that is when uh, MCA put out their version of scripts of the bridge where they rearranged the track order they they um uh, changed the title of one of the songs to, to be more radio friendly title they cut the end of the fucking album off it altogether i mean they, they, they raped it yeah they raped it and that is why we were so if anybody really wants to know why we were so intense about remaining the integrity of our music, get a copy of that fucking MCA record that they the, 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 that they call Script to the Bridge, which isn't, that's wrapped in yellow fucking plastic or whatever it is, and and listen to that and compare that to the to our version, and that is the reason it's right there. Well, I think it's you know it's it's also true that you know had you gone into all of that. And complied to the their wishes, and you're you know all of a sudden they've got you filling up, you know football stadiums and hanging you know platinum records on the wall. While that's great in some respects, it does kind of compromise the art and the intention of what you were trying to do musically, if that was your intention, and it clearly it clearly wasn't. And I think that's to the benefit for the fans and for the music. It, it yeah, I mean it, it's important for me though that to be to be honest about it. We had no problem with with getting to be as big as you two, as long as it was as long as we were doing it on our terms. Sure, you know if, if we were making our music our way, we were packaging it the way that we wanted to package it because all the band had input on it. So when you bought a Chameleons record, you had Chameleons input right down to the to the middles on the record. To, to what was inscribed on the outer edge of the when we cut it, to the what the cover looks like, to what the cover says, to the words on it, uh, the text on it. It was all the band that was doing that. We didn't hand it off for somebody else to do that for us. We did that, and then we pre we present all of that to a graphic designer. But I mean, even that, a lot of the work with that was pretty done. Uh, was done pretty much because Dave Fielding, prior to uh, becoming a full time guitar player with the Chameleons. Was a, a was in training as a graphic designer. He had a natural talent as a graphic designer. He, 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 that's what he was doing. He was at a, um, an advertising agency for a short while called Yellowhammer in London, uh, in Manchester, um, that had London offices. And he, that's what he was doing. So he absolutely knew um, how to put it together. You know, we had this um, expertise in our in our in our band. So you know, why not do it all ourselves and that please ourselves and then the person that's buying the record it's it's chameleon from top to bottom yeah you know, it's not just the music that's coming off the plastic i know i know for me you know as, as a fan you know you know the chameleons were one of those bands that you wanted everyone else to know about but at the same time you wanted to keep it all for yourself because it was yeah. it was your secret this you know and, yeah. and i and i'm i i have to believe you've heard that time and time again over the I've last 40 years I've, I've, I've been fans of bands like that myself I yeah the same I felt that way about John Fox's Ultravox. Yeah, you know, I feel yeah. that way too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I know what that feels like, and I understand it. Yeah. One of the things that that we never had here in the United States, and it, it's it's kind of unfortunate. You know, we never had a, a John Peel in the U.S., and I know that you know he plays a pretty pivotal component in the, in the Chameleon story. You did the uh, the John Peel sessions, and, and you released that uh, that album uh, a, a while back, and those, those sessions are absolutely fantastic. Tell me about him and how important he was 
to you guys at that time? Oh man, he was he was iconic. I mean, it, for me personally, because I'd been listening to him from a very young age, I, I was picking him up on my transistor radio um, in the late sixties and stuff when he was um, DJing at pirate radio and and whatnot. And then and then the, when the BBC reinvented itself, he, and he, there are a lot of those DJs that were pirate radio uh, DJs on Caroline and stuff. They all ended up working at the BBC on, on the newly vamped Radio 1. The thing about John was he was broadcasting on the only national radio station in the country, right? B the BBC were the only ones at that time that, yeah, that, that their, their coverage was the entire country. So if you got on John Peel um, or, you know, on any or, or even Kid Jensen or any of those late night uh, DJs, you were being, you were, your music was being broadcast from, you know, Land's End to John O'Groats. So, I mean, John, so I knew John from that background because I mean, that's how I knew about, you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex and early Bowie and all that kind of thing. Because um, he, they all came through, through him. He was a legend even before punk happened. Um, and then when, you know, when he would feature bands, especially after the punk explosion, when so many bands were suddenly erupting all over the place, um, and you would listen to like two brand new bands a night that, that he discovered, right? That he that managed to get sessions. So we became huge fans of his because it was the best way of finding new music, you know. And you might not like it, wasn't like you liked everything that he did, you didn't, right? I mean, there was loads of things John was into that I didn't get, right? That didn't <laughs> move me, but there was a great amount that he, that he did. So, I mean, when we kept when we approached Peel, getting on his show was the was the was what we were trying to do we weren't seeing it as a stepping stone to getting more exposure or anything you know we didn't see it as a career thing or a strategic career move we just wanted to be on his show because we were fans of his show so much fantastic music came through john yeah you know everybody else was what was listening and that's when i realized that even the majors were all listening to john because we, we 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 you know when our Peel session was broadcast on Peel, um, our lives changed. I know it's a cliche to say your life changes overnight, but it really, really did. Yeah, My life changed overnight. The next morning, that phone started ringing and my life completely changed forever. That's That was the the power of it, you know. And, and a John Peel endorsement was just like better than, better than anything. <laughs> you had a John Peel endorsement. I mean... We had a John Peel endorsement. Jesus, man, he was hyping our session the <laughs> night before the broadcast. He's saying, "Make sure you don't listen. Uh, make sure you don't miss tomorrow night's program because I've got a real fucking, I've got a real treat for you tomorrow." And at first, we're going like, oh, "I wonder who that is." You know, we didn't even realize <laughs> he was talking about us because we didn't have a name for the band. Oh, and that was funny. We hadn't even thought of a name, and he says, "Like, you better think of one pretty damn quick." We go, oh, okay. You know, we'll... That was our next task was to try and figure out what the band was called. We didn't even have that when he wrote to us. We hadn't got that far to actually think about what we we're going to call the band. So, I mean, to have that endorsement, you know, was obviously a major, major plus. And the next day, the phone was ringing, and we, you know, it, everything was on a roller coaster after that moment. But we, and my life to this day, yeah, to this day, right now, talking to you, it's not, it, it, it's all that emotion. So, where does Tony Fletcher come into the into the picture for you guys? I mean, I know he was. You know, in a way, he was kind of the manager of the band, but he had been working for a record well, company, sure, yeah. and then eventually, you know, started to work full time. How did he get involved in in uh, the Chameleon story? Well, our our um, involvements with record labels were was we just it was horrendous, <laughs> and we got ourselves in all sorts of fucking problems. And we, we, at this particular time, we really weren't able to do anything except play gigs. I think gigs was the only thing we could do couldn't write uh, for, for, for legal reasons. We couldn't uh, publish anything. We couldn't um, do anything. I think, you know, the only thing we did during that time was the, the third Peel session. I think Peel heard the, of what was going on. And he said, right, we'll get him in for another session on here. And we did the Peel session, but we weren't able to do anything. And then this management company came along called Kennedy Street Enterprises that, that, that were, they'd been around Manchester involved in promotion and management and whatnot since the 60s. I mean, the first thing I saw when I walked into Kennedy Street Enterprises was a photograph of Danny Vitesh, who was the uh, the CEO, um, sitting there posing with the Beatles, which imp impressed <laughs> me no end. Um, and they they wanted they took us under their wing and they said like we want to work with you and they got all the legalities ironed out so that we could get back to 
uh, what you know making records and 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 get our careers back on track and tony fletcher worked for them the Tony was a troubleshooter who they'd they'd send they'd say you know go and look after so and so um, they do they've got a, a show tonight at the Apollo go down and make sure they've got everything they need and all that kind of thing, and that's exactly what he did for us. We were playing a show at the Ritz in Manchester and he just turned up, and we didn't we knew the he said oh, I'm Tony from Kennedy Street and we were like oh how are you doing and at the time <laughs> we were talking about a backdrop, okay. and our our head our chief roadie was talking to another guy and he's going, what we need, what we could do with really is a fucking big black drape. And so on, and he, and he goes, you need a black drape? And we, and, and, and uh, his name was Spoonhead. He goes, yeah, I need it. I need it for, for, he says, right, hold on. He gets his mobile phone out, which impressed us. He had a mobile phone, <laughs> right? This is the late eighties. You can imagine him, it's about this big, right? <laughs> Like it was like a house brick, right? <laughs> he takes his phone and he gets on his phone and he phones the Apollo across town, which is a big theater across town, which we all knew about. Obviously. And he goes, right, I need, I need, a, I need a, a black drape. Uh, it's got to be this big, blah, blah. He gives the dimensions, right? Just on visual and said like, and I need it. I need it within 30 minutes. Right. Okay, good. It's going to be here in an half, half an hour. And we just <laughs> went like, we weren't used to this kind of efficiency, right? Sure. We're like, okay. <laughs> what did you say your name was? <laughs> you know? And so we spent that that whole the rest of that night because he didn't really know who we were, to be fair. Right. right? He knew that he knew that they'd signed up, but he didn't know anything about the band. He didn't know anything really about the band. And he sees this gig at the Ritz, which is like sold out, go crazy, stage invasion, the whole the, the every, you know, the whole nine yards. And um he's like, what the f- Fuck is it? And we so we we're talking. He's getting to know us. We're getting to know him. And he's like, well, "Where are you going tomorrow?" And we said, "Well, we've got to fly to Paris. We're doing this thing in Paris. We're doing this television thing in Paris, and then we're doing this show." And he's like, "Okay." He says, "Look, I'm, I'm coming with you. Uh, I'm coming with you." So he <laughs> get, gets on the phone again and he books himself a plane ticket. And now he's now he's coming with us to Paris. He organizes the car to take us for, to the television studio to the venue, and he does all of that. He's running, and then he's like, and then he's talking to the promoter. He's going, "There's no lighting engineer," and the French guy's going, "No, no, we don't have lighting. We are, can't afford light. We have no one to." He goes, right, "Where's your lighting desk?" And he goes, "I do love it." He's right, and he runs upstairs and he does the lights for the show. <laughs> this is Tony Fletcher. So from that moment on, we fell in love with him, and he, we became really, really close. And he managed us unofficially because the Kennedy Street wanted a management deal, and Tony, you know, kept saying, "Don't sign it." Don't sign it. Let them do. Let them be your publishers if you want to do that. But, but stall on the management contract. Don't sign it. So don't. Yeah. And we're like, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep. You know, I'll, I'll be the buffer. And we kept wanting him to whistle. Well, why don't you manage us, Tony? And he's like, uh, I said, it's complicated. It's a conflict of interest because they, he, they employed him, right? They employed him, so if they wanted to manage us, and we kept saying, well, we're not sure. We know another, and then he becomes our manager. Yeah, it's it's impossible. <laughs> but then something happened, and I'm not going to get into it. But something happened, and he came in one day, and we were having a fucking argument as usual, me and Dave. And then as soon as he comes in, it all stops and goes away. All the tension goes our way. No, nobody cares anymore about what we were arguing about. <laughs> hey, you know, and he walks in like a fucking ray of sunshine, and he says, "Like, I'm going to manage you." And we just went like, "What?" Because he turned so many people down. You know, sure. You you know. I don't know if you know 10 CC and all that. Lot, sure. He, he turned them all down. And uh, he says like, yeah, he said, uh, I'm going to manage you. He said, you have to go to America. You have to be prepared to stay there two years. We're going to make the next record over there. But if you're prepared to do that, then I'll, I'll manage it. And we'll give, I'll make Harvey Lisberg, who's a Kennedy Street guy. I'll make him happy. Give him a couple of points to keep him sweet. Because all he wants to do is be involved in something that's that's successful. That's all he wants. So he'll be all right. And we're going like fantastic, you know, man. We couldn't believe it. We couldn't believe it. We were really happy, and we all made the commitments that he wanted us to commit. And then two weeks later, he was dead. Mm. So um, that was really traumatic. And I don't. And the reason the band didn't survive that after that, it was just that was the last. Um, cause we'd had all these problems that we met head on and got through, survived, kept going, kept making the music. That was just too much. Uh, it, it knocked us off for six. I think the only one of the few times Dave Feeling and I actually embraced in tears, we were like hugging each other, wow. giving each other comfort. That's the only, one of the only times that ever happened. 
you know, of, you know, of all the, the management stories you ever hear in, in, in music, you, you rarely hear one that is positive. <laughs> and, mm. you know, in, in this situation, it, it, it was. And it's a, it's, it's a shame that, you know, that he, he died yeah. you know, so suddenly from a heart attack. But, but, 42 years old he was. Yeah, but, but, but nevertheless, I mean, what a terrible loss for you guys just as things were starting to, you know, really kind of yeah. to, to show real promise for you guys after that yeah. third record. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind, eh? The, the the sequel album to Strange Times that had been recorded when we were writing it at the time um, would have been a fucking masterpiece. I have no doubt about that yeah. whatsoever. And B, it, it, you know, focusing on the United States where we were getting much more respect, you know, we were getting a lot, you know, the, 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 the media in the United States were, were treating us with a lot of respect. They actually understood our music we understood the ethic of the band where the british press didn't and we were getting like ignored um deliberately and and insulted you know yeah um, and when we redid the tour with the mighty lemon drops that you mentioned those venues were selling out right and it was because chameleons were on the bill and when we went back to the united kingdom we were reading about what this wonderful tour that mighty lemon drops had just done in the united states and of the <laughs> chameleons there was absolutely no mention whatsoever. unbelievable um, you, know. you know, you so you guys broke up after that, like you said, and it John was... left the band first. Yeah, he, right. Uh, immediately. We went in and did the Tony Fletcher uh, tracks, um, the first four, uh, which were you know of, the, of this new record that we were writing, the first four demos. Because he phoned me up and he just said, "I'm going in there and I'm setting my kit up." Because he says, "I don't know what else to do." So I'm sitting here in pieces and I don't know what else to do. So I said, "So you can do what you want, but I'm going in there and setting up my drums." And I said, "Well, if you're going in there, I'm going in there." Right, right, and um, yeah, and then we said to Dave and Reg, "You're like me and John are going in. Um, we're going to carry on. We're going to record." So they, uh, uh, you know, they said, "All right, let's do that." And that's where those four tracks came from. But the strain was too much. So by the end, at the end of that particular little session when we recorded these four demos, uh, John, I was in a cafe, a local cafe there, and John came in. He said, "Like I've, I can't do it anymore. I've had enough," because it was a very stressful uh, time in there. We were, uh, you know, it was. It was not ideal. It was very difficult circumstances. But I think amongst that, we've, you know, we did some, I think, I personally think I did the best work I've ever done for the community. Like, is it any wonder? And the healer, particularly, uh, Transcendental for me, I think it, like, I think it would have been a, an amazing album. Yeah. But, and I, I, I followed him. I just said, I'm not staying if you're not. So it, it After those sessions, it would uh, be another 14 years before you guys would, would reform and do another album. Uh, yeah. you know, why call it anything? Which I thought was a great, a, a, a great record to come back. I like, it. I, I liked it. Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. I really liked it too. And I, I just wonder what you know. So after all that time, what brought you guys back together? I mean, fourteen years apart is is Dave a, engineered a good it. Good long Dave time. Engineered, Dave Fielding engineered the whole thing. Uh, he got a contact. I was being managed by a guy called Rob Brown at the time, and he got hold of my manager and said like. Would Mark be willing to have a sit down a meeting? And um, but he wouldn't really say. It, would, it was a bit vague about what it was about. But um, Rob came to me. He said, "I think we should do this, man." I said, "I think you should meet him because there's been a lot of animosity and a lot of grief and a lot of stress and all that." But I'm thinking, you know what? You know that is a if he's going to offer an olive branch like that, it takes. I know knowing Dave like I knew him, it took must have took a lot to do that. You know so. I'm like, all right, fuck it, I'll go. And we had this meeting and we came away and I'm saying, we had this meeting and I'm, I, as we were walking away, I said to Rob, is he saying what I think he's saying? Because, you know, am I imagining things or did he just talk about getting the band back together? And like he said, hey, he's talking about reforming the community. I'm like, fuck me, you know, never saw that coming. But then he's, and then so when we had another meeting and he's saying, but you'll have to talk to Reg. I said, well, have you not talked to him? He said, no, I'm, I haven't spoken to him about it. And I said, so, well, why, you two are like pick two peas in the pod. Why do I have to, do, well, he, he needs to be, you know, need, I think he'd be better from you. All right. So I go around and see Reg. I haven't seen him in 10 years. I'm not trying to do it. He opens the door. It's been like, I hadn't seen him for like a week or something. <laughs> he comes in, he goes, do you want a cup of tea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sit down. And we're just like, so then we start talking and, and you know, Reggie's only concern was like, I don't want to be in the middle of you two at war with each other. And I'm like, well, we're not going to do that. You know, and we'll, if every, you know, if every, if unless everybody wants to do something, it won't be, it, we won't do it. If one person doesn't want to do something, we don't do it. Yeah. Right? No voting. Yeah. We'll just say like, well, Reg isn't doing it. We're not doing it. Um, 
And they said, like, yeah, okay, that's it. And then that went by the wayside after a while. But, I mean, at least it got, you know, it got the ball up. But it was very much Dave who did that, you know. It wasn't me. When the end result of it was a really good record. I mean, it really was a very, I, I very good record. Great record. I think, I, you know, what disappointed me was that, you know, I thought, I mean, I wasn't, I, I mean, I, the others were pretty out of touch, by, but when we came back together, they weren't, because I was the only one in, on the internet at that time. Right, mm -hmm. I was I was familiar with the internet. They they weren't, and I knew uh, that the audience had grown and stuff, and I knew that the popularity was there. They weren't so sure about that, so they were a little bit of out of touch. But where I was out of touch was, I thought that we'd we'd get an opportunity to to get together, figure out how we're going to write with each other again because it's been ten years, right? We're all different people now, slightly different people anyway. You know, we're all ten years older. And we're going to figure that out. We're going to make a record. And then, one, you know, and as I'm making it, I'm thinking that. I'm thinking, all right, this is a good starting point. But the next one we do will be the, a killer. Right. And we never got the opportunity to because mm. because that album polarized our audience so much that half the audience didn't buy it. So the record label just went, well, we're not going to do another one because it didn't sell that well. Right. <laughs> so we didn't get an opportunity to go in to make another one. And then, unfortunately, in the wake of that, it fell apart again. And, and, and having heard the newer the, the newer songs on the, on the EP, which comes out on, on May twenty fourth, it's pretty clear to me that the, the the like you say, you know, the the band is is back on track. It's something to be really really proud of. And the new album is coming out, uh, you know, later this year. I, I, as a fan, I have to say I'm very excited about it. I, I know you guys are going to be on tour coming through uh, our area, Space Ballroom in Hamden, Connecticut, on August 9th, and the Sinclair Theater. In Cambridge, Mass, on August tenth, I, I, you know, I, I hope I have the opportunity to get, to get out there to see you guys again because I have always felt that the the Chameleons are a band that you know there's no lukewarm opinion. You either have you either have never heard them or you love them, and that's yeah. and that's the only there's no there's no gray area there, Mark. No, there's no gray area, but I do think that the new record one of the things it's going to do. I think I think. It's going to bring people to this band that probably, um, you know, for the first time. I think I think it's going to. I mean, there's a lot of people there that don't really didn't really care for uh, a lot of that, that early stuff that are going to really like this. So I think I think it's going to expand our audience. I think it will polarize some of them to a certain degree. That that shimmering Dave Fielding guitar sound isn't present, and that might be enough for them to go. Ah, oh, it's not really my thing anymore. You've got the old, you know, to, to those people, I'd say, you've got those records, you know, you've got those records that we made with Dave. Enjoy. Yeah. You know, we're still going to play them uh, at shows. We're still going to play that stuff. We're not slamming the door on it completely. But in terms of what our new stuff, we, it, this is very much us. This is me and Reg and Danny and Stephen and Todd. Well, you know? I think if fans go in with an open mind, they'll realize yeah. that this is the chameleons and it's, yeah. it is definitely worth enjoying and embracing. Mark, this yeah. has been this has been so great to talk to you. I'm 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 so happy to have the opportunity. And like I said, I I, I should be thanking you for you know 40, 40 years of of uh, of of joy. Thank you. Man. I just want before before we wrap it up though, I do yeah. want to say though that that track, the 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 B side of the single, is a song that was one of the first songs we ever wrote together. Actually, it, we've reworked it, um, and it was one of six that we reworked for the for the Ritz history of the chameleons that we did last Christmas, the live shows. Mm. And then we recorded them. And five of those, I gave I gave Philip a choice. He could pick five of the six. They're all legacy tracks. We did The Fan and the Bellows, Things I Wish I'd Said, Every Day I'm Crucified, Nostalgia, and uh, Nathan's Phase. Uh, and one other, and, and Endlessly Falling, which we use as a B-side. They're actually going to come out on a German label this year. Um, so it's stay tuned to our social media and everything for information about that. He's got an underground label in Berlin. It, five of those tracks, um, five of the six are going to come out on his record that he's doing. So we're going to actually have two records out. One of them are going to be like five reworked songs that we never really finished or we mm. never really felt, I never really felt satisfied with back in the day. Um, and then we've got Arctic Moon, which is brand new material coming out um, at some point. Great. We finish. We're going to finish it in July. So I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. By the way, happy uh, birthday in advance. I know you're, that's right around the corner you. for you. You're very welcome. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be stuck on a Nut Virgin air, airplane for the whole of my birthday. But thank, <laughs> you very, thank you very much. That's okay. Mark, great to talk to you. Have a great, a great afternoon. Likewise, man. Thank Take you care, so much. Doc. 
The name of the upcoming album from the Chameleons is Arctic Moon, and it should be available later this year. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, subscribe to it, like it, share it with all your friends. You can also follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. And you can email me at backs at rock102.com. I'd love to hear what you think. Thanks again to Metro Chrysler, Dodge Jeep, and Rambo Chicopee for their support. And thank you for listening to Baxi's Musical Podcast.